everybody. Thank you very much for sticking around till four o'clock. Very impressed that we've got such a good turnout as we do. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll just introduce myself quickly. Uh, my name is Stella Lithgow and I do uh, the day-to-day -day operational leadership of the uh, School Resource Management Advisor Program. School Resource Management Advisors are a free hands-on tool that you can access as CEOs, school business managers or uh, CFOs. If you want um, suggestions for where you can redirect funds to priority areas, if you want a general health check of how your finances are doing, if you would like a health check on how your financial governance is working, or if you've got a specific ask on uh, your finance that uh, you just need a bit of outside help with, we can talk to you about that as well. Equally, if you're ever interested in becoming an SRMA, there's uh, still places available and uh, you'll definitely see my face again if that's something you're interested in as I'll give you a really good introduction to uh, what we do and what we ask of you if that's something that you would like to do. Uh, Sarah Ray and Michelle Charlton and Neil sat at the front are uh, from our supplier organisations and they can talk to you at the end if that is something you might be interested in doing either full time or on the side of your day job. We do have a number of SRMAs including both um, here today who uh, work as SRMAs alongside uh, their workers, uh, chief financial officers in the sector. So just to introduce this, Patrick Overy and uh, Joe Marchant, who are two of our uh, long-standing um, veteran SRMAs. They've been into uh, a lot of different uh, schools, trusts, maintained schools, local authorities, SATs, MATs, and they've seen all sorts. So uh, what we were hoping today was we'll do a bit of a question and answer session where we'll talk a little bit about uh, what SRMAs might be able to do for you and also some of the things that you can learn as an SRMA that are helpful just in terms of what we can learn as a whole sector from the themes that emerge. Um, so would you like to just very quickly introduce yourselves? Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, I'm Joe Marchant. I'm Head of Estates at Education for the 21st Century, which is uh, an eight school map based in Bromley. And uh, I've been an SRMA for four and a half years now, and uh, I've done deployments in primary, secondary, special, AP, SATs and MATs. Hello, and I'm Patrick Overy. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Learning Partners Academy Trust, uh, which is a trust of 12 schools in Surrey, with four more on the way in September. So it's a busy time at the moment. Um, so I've been an SRMA since 2019. I've done uh, quite a number of deployments, although most of mine have been in mainstream schools as opposed to special schools, uh, primary, secondary and multi-academy trusts. So to both of you, in terms of if I was a CFO sitting here today or a CEO, what might you describe the purpose of an SRMA visit to be and what might they expect if you were to visit them? I mean, I'd say the, the key thing is it's about professional support. So there, there can be this misconception that it's all about um, you know, cost cutting or it's some sort of audit or some sort of inspection and it really isn't any of those things. Um, so the visit is all about understanding your school, understanding your team, understanding the challenges that you face and providing professional support from people who have worked in the sector or maybe continue to work in the sector um, and trying to work with you to find solutions to some of those challenges. Um, the, the sort of circumstances of a visit vary depending on the trust or school we're visiting. So there are some trusts that I've worked with and schools that I've worked with that have been in really quite significant deficits. And obviously the focus there is inevitably on how do we try and return the school to a, a break-even position, which involves some sort of savings. Also, I've worked with schools that are actually running quite substantial surpluses. And often that's around how do schools use their surpluses effectively or how do they, maybe if they're not in surplus, they're on break even, how can we reprioritise resources into areas of priority for the schools? How can we get more value out of, of what they're doing? Um, I think it's, it's really important to emphasise it's not an audit. So this isn't that we're asking for loads and loads of documents and we're checking up on everything and trying to kind of catch people out. That's absolutely not what it's about. It's about um, we, we take information that, that's given and there's obviously some sort of sanity checking of things. But ultimately, if, if you as a school leader tell us something, we, we take that you come at face value and we, we work with you on that. And it's not an inspection. You don't come out of it with a grading. Um, it's all about actually what, what suggestions and recommendations can we make for you as a trust to consider and decide whether or not it's appropriate for you to adopt in your setting. 
think I would just uh, add to what um, Patrick said there. So obviously it is about finding money, you know, for priority areas, mainly, you know, school improvement. This is what we're all about. Um, just to say it's about having a fresh pair of eyes come into to your trust and, and your school, uh, which I think is always a valuable thing. And, and again, as Patrick was saying, you know, it is, it is supportive and not judgmental. And I know that I have been on deployments where initially it's been a, lot, it's been a bit frosty in the room. But by the time, you know, we've come to the end of the deployment, it's going, thanks, Joe, that was great. Anytime you're passing, do pop in, so, which is really nice to be able to build Build that rapport and working relationship and, and trust uh, with, with schools. And I think also it's about sometimes having an opportunity for discussion and reflection. I know that on one of my deployments, we were talking around a, a particular initiative and, um, you know, the, the CEO and the, the chair of the trustees said, you know, you've made us sit down and think about this issue, which was all about increasing pupil numbers. Um, we've been sort of, you know, discussing it for a while, but never in any depth. And we've, we've actually given the time to it now. So that's been really valuable for us. And I think in terms of what you can expect, so basically there'll be several meetings with the, the CEO, stroke head teacher, CFO, SBM, whoever is in charge of the finance, to basically look at obviously things like integrated curriculum and financial planning, uh, obviously your finances, review of contracts, financial governments, governance, and you know there might be other areas as well, such as estates sometimes comes into it, fundraising. Um, that we might also be asked to talk about or might sort of, you know, come organically out of the conversations that, that I had with the trust. And basically how I do a deployment will be I will have um, two meetings with, uh, with the trust and um, in between times I'll be doing a lot of analysis in the background, looking at the financial information. Then I'll come up with a draft report which is shared with the trust confidentially for any factual inaccuracies and any other discussion points. Uh, and also gives the, the trust an opportunity to feedback on how did they find the SRMA process. Um, and then the, the report goes um, is submitted to the SFA for QA and eventually it goes back to the trust on an official basis. Then they can then share it with trustees. So um, in terms of deployments where you feel that you've gone and added some real value, to either what the trust was already doing or things perhaps that uh, you know they were struggling to see a way out of uh, whatever situation they were in. Can you tell us about some times that you feel you've added real value during your deployments? I think the, the thing I might initially say actually, which, which is going to sound slightly counterintuitive because at first, first glance it doesn't sound like it's valuable, but in the majority of deployments, what I find I end up doing actually is validating what the school thinks in the first place. So the reason that adds value is it gives them confidence. Quite often they have a, they understand their setting and quite often they have a view on what the challenges are, but they're not quite sure. They're not quite sure whether they've got the right budget assumptions. They're not quite sure whether their uh, forecasts are right. They're not quite sure of um, whether their understanding of the context around certain things is correct. And actually just by coming in and uh, helping them find the time for those conversations and providing validation and assurance around those things, you can leave the school more confident about the way forwards and the actions it needs to take. Um, so uh, th there are occasions when I've maybe had conversations with um, a head teacher about a staffing change they need to make, which they've been probably knowing deep down they needed to grapple with, but they just haven't got that confidence that it's definitely the right thing to do. Or maybe they've got a bit of resistance from someone else on their team or their trustees aren't sure. And actually saying to them, no, you're absolutely on the right track here and we would absolutely encourage you to keep going forwards with this gives them that ability to go and make those changes. Um, so it, you know, it sounds like well, what's been added there, because they already knew, but they, they didn't have the confidence to go and act on it. Um, or maybe even they haven't spent the time with the right people in the room because the focus is always on, often on the day-to-day. -day. They just needed that space to really think about some of the strategic challenges. Um, so, so I think that actually is probably the most common thing from, from my deployments that comes up, rather than the off, it's quite rare for there to be something totally left field to the school. I, I don't know, Joe, whether that's the same experience you have or... Yeah, no, I would definitely say so. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that I find quite rewarding is, you know, if you're going into a school or a trust, you know, being able to upskill them in certain areas. Um, you kind of think that everybody knows about integrated curriculum and financial planning. That isn't actually the case, and there's no shame in that. Um, I've just recently done a deployment where, uh, you know, I mentioned ICFP and there's like blank looks, and I thought, okay, you haven't heard of it. That's fine. Um, and one of the things that I've been able to do is to signpost them to a lot of the DfE guidance that's out there on ICFP and basically said, right, these are the top seven documents that you need to look at, read them in this order, and this will make sense to you. And they've been able to use it in a bit of a restructuring that they needed to have. So it's really useful to be able to share knowledge in that way. 
I think it's good also to come in for, for a different perspective. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll do a SWOT analysis, you know, your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, um, because I'm looking at it through a fresh pair of eyes, as I mentioned previously. And, you know, I can come up with things that others don't see when you're right in the middle of a situation. Um, it, it's difficult to kind of like step back and have that different perspective. So I know that some trusts have found that really helpful. And I've also kind of looked at, you know, environmental scanning as well, the bigger picture of, of where they're at, which they've also found helpful. Um, I think a lot of the time it's about just having somebody who really wants to listen. You know, when I do a deployment, um, the first thing I do is I'll, I'll, I'll have a face to face meeting, uh, obviously having done some background work before I have that meeting. And I just let people talk to me because, you know, trusts just want to be heard, basically. And it's really nice if, you know, if you go in there and, you know, just let them speak because you need to understand the context. Every school is unique. So that context is absolutely key. And sometimes I'll be sitting there for the best part of two hours and then eventually they've told me everything they want to tell me. And then I can start the dialogue and start asking questions. But I think it's really important to, to give, you know, trust that, that space to, you know, let me explain my context because, you know, that really is a key thing. And I think also one of, one of the, um, the ideas that, that I give to others that add value is um, I might say to them, have you really looked at the income and expenditure with regard to that particular area? So nursery provision, for example, does it actually break even? If it doesn't, do you know that it doesn't break even? And do you know the reasons for that? And, you know, other sort of, you know, smaller um, financial areas might be after school clubs. You know, do you know how much the school is subsidising them? Can you afford to be doing that if you're in a deficit situation? Are you paying for therapists that you're not recharging for? You know, can you afford to be doing that? And I know that in a, in a trust that I've worked with recently, I asked them to do this deep dive on a number of different areas, including, you know, does your swimming pool cost actually break even? Um, and they found that really useful because it was a different way of looking at it and they'd not done that before. So I think it is just about sharing some of the ideas and, and knowledge that I've gained from other deployments and that I've gained through throughout my working career, uh, which is really helpful to, to other trusts. I think, um, sorry, I think the, as, as Joseph alluded to there, there are sometimes kind of more detailed technical issues that the school either doesn't have the experience to look into or perhaps just doesn't have the time because everybody's focused on, on just day-to-day -day delivery. So yeah, analysing how a, a nursery uh, is performing or a part of the school is performing or perhaps putting together some evidence around why some financial support's needed or giving some ideas as to where a school could go for additional funding grants and those sorts of things. There, there are cases where I've got involved where a school's been in discussion with the DfE around a need for financial support and we're able to help gather the information needed to validate whether or not that support is, is necessary. So I think that can be really valuable to a school. Um, the other thing that's helpful is, is SRMAs are often able to access data that, that isn't kind of published, if you like. So there's, there's the sort of school's benchmarking service, which is really valuable, but sometimes there's something a trust wants to look at that you just can't get hold of the data for. So an example in a uh, deployment I did recently was around the need to understand about energy usage as opposed to energy cost. So energy costs out there, but energy usage isn't. Well, I've got a pool of 16 schools that I can access that data for, I can share on an anonymous basis. So we can find a similar school and provide some of that information. Uh, other deployments, so there's one I had a, a, involved a PFI school. So again, it's quite hard to find that relevant information. I haven't got any PFI, PFI schools in our trust, but I was able to contact another SRMA who was willing on an anonymous basis to share some of the data from their school. So we can often access data that a school needs that it, it might struggle to get hold of otherwise. And I think that could be really value in terms of schools understanding the context that they operate in. Because sometimes schools can think, well, we think we're doing okay in this area, but we don't really know how that compares to other people. And actually understanding that can really help the school uh, work out where to focus its priorities. Thank you. So um, we do have a sort of standard type of deployment that most schools will uh, will take up. There are sort of more uh, specific bespoke deployments we can do if you've got a quite a chunky individual need. But most schools will, at least to start off with, go for our comprehensive deployment. So. What sort of outputs might you expect if you went in to do one of our standard comprehensive deployments for a school that isn't actually in deficit, but might be a bit worried about future year's budgets? Okay, I'll kick off with that one. Um, so obviously we're doing a review of the ICFP metrics and looking at contact ratios. Uh, it may be that, you know, in a couple of deployments, I've said to you, you know, your contact ratio isn't, uh, you know, as high as it might be. You might want to get a timetabling expert in to look at your timetable to see, you know, where you can make savings there. Um, I think 
there's certain bespoke areas. Um, I know in the one deployment that I did, you know, their, their IT support was costing an awful lot of money. And I've come in and said, you know, why have you got that contract? Well, it's an historical thing. Well, you really need to be looking at that because you're paying a disproportionate high cost for your IT support for the size of your school. Obviously, reviewing contracts to ensure, you know, that, that you're getting best values and then, you know, signposting schools to the different buying for schools frameworks that the DfE offers. Um, that's always a useful thing to do. And sometimes it's just useful for schools to look at those frameworks and benchmark the costs against the costs that they're able to get with their local suppliers. Sometimes that, that does also help to drive down costs as well. Um, and I think as, as I've alluded to before, you know, looking at the INE for various bespoke specific areas, that, that's also a, a useful indicator of, you know, are you breaking even there? And then maybe looking at, you know, reviewing of lettings and, you know, are you really covering all the costs, particularly when you take into energy uh, costs as well? Um, you know, are you, are you really doing that? And I know that I've offered sort of specialist advice about, you know, actually recruiting a fundraiser, how you would go about that and, you know, ideas for how fundraisers could operate within your schools. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, pooling all my experience from, from different schools that I've been in, different deployments that I've been in, and, you know, just trying to give different ideas in terms of outputs from an SRMA visit. So I would certainly agree with all of that. I mean, I think one of the key outputs uh, I would suggest for, for a trust in a situation is you get some validation over your own forecasting and some additional confidence. I mean, none, none of us are kind of certain of what, um, what the future holds in terms of costs and budgets and staff pay. Uh, but a sanity check on that, I think, is really valuable. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd sort of suggest is um, nobody likes talking about cost savings. But when you sit down at a teacher or CEO and you say, uh, what, what are the challenges you face and what would you like to invest more in? Everyone's eyes, eyes light up and you suddenly get this great big long list of things the school would really like to do. And so I often say, well, OK, let, let's have a look at your school and see what, what could we do to enable some of that. Um, and sometimes there are things that if you describe as a cost saving, people would sort of be reluctant to do. But when you say, actually, if we spent less in this area, you could do these things that are on your development plan and on your priority list and you think would really add value to your school and your community, suddenly that people get very excited about. So I would hope that you come out with some options of things that you could perhaps stop doing or, or reduce your expenditure on in order to be able to afford some of the things to real priorities. Um, some of the sort of sanity checking Joe was talking about around um, the sort of different, for want of a better phrase, kind of business areas, if you like, so lettings or nurseries or other, other kinds of street parts of the school, I think are valuable. Um, the other thing I find is quite often through the deployment, just a lot of questions come up. So often the school business managers just got things that have been on their to-do list for ages to look into. Um, and as you get to know them better, they say, what, what do you think about this? Or have you experienced this before? Or how, how should I look into this further? And some of them, the SRA might... SRMA might have experience to answer, some of them they may just be able to point someone in the right direction. Um, but certainly as the, the relationship develops, the, there's often an openness around those sorts of things and we can provide some support and advice on things that maybe never came up at the initial part of the deployment. Wonderful. And how do you feel that uh, the learning you've gathered during deployments has actually helped your own practice in your own trusts? I mean, that, that's the best bit of it, really. Um, so there's, there's a wonderful opportunity for us to, to go and see different settings, um, see how things work in different schools and trusts. Um, and the, there's certainly loads of cases I can point to where I've, I've sort of borrowed great ideas from other, other trusts. I mean, an example I would give, um, and I quite often give when people ask me a question like that, is a trust that I thought had a great model where um, in a secondary, depending on the options choices that get picked in a given year, you often end up with a little bit of uh, what we call curriculum margin, so a bit of spare staff time in certain subjects. Um, and that trust was using that spare time to put the secondary teachers into the primaries to cover the PPA time, um, which I thought was a really nice model in that it was the primaries that fed into the secondaries, so it supported the whole transition process because those, those teachers were getting to know the year fives and sixes. It meant those children were getting some real specialist inputs. They might be getting a science teacher or a languages teacher rather than uh, just some sort of generic PPA cover. Um, those staff were getting the CPD of being able to go and work in a primary setting. Um, and of course, it was saving the schools the cover costs. So, so I thought that was a really great model that we've been working on looking at how we could implement in our trust. Um, and there's also a bit sometimes about learning from, from mistakes other trusts have made. And one issue that, um, that I've come across a couple of times on deployments is around 
the accuracy of financial reporting, and sometimes schools have management financial reporting that doesn't actually match the statutory accounts when you compare the two. And often the discrepancies are quite small, but on a couple of occasions I've experienced a really big discrepancy. And that's obviously a problem because trustees and school leaders are making decisions on the basis of financial information that just isn't correct. Um, so there's a few things we've put into our own processes as a trust to try and address that. So one of those is that as part of our year-end process, we now do a formal reconciliation between the management accounts and the statutory accounts, and that's presented to the audit committee. So they expect to see that. So they get a guarantee. In our, I mean, there was a reconciliation before, but it didn't go to the audit committee. So now it's part of the process. They see that and hold me to account and our team to account to ensure that that's correct. Yeah, I think uh, it was just interesting there that uh, Patrick was saying about, you know, some things that you see that don't really work well in practice. And one of the things that I learned at one of my deployments is a large secondary school decided that as a cost cutting measure, they would actually uh, make their mid midday meal supervisors redundant and uh, use teachers to, to cover the, the lunchtime period. This really didn't work. And for the amount of money that they saved on midday meal supervisors, it wasn't a good plan. So they reinstated them. So that was an interesting lesson to learn there. But, but other things that I've come across and uh, you know, used in, in other settings is, um, for example, we've, we've all got to do marketing these days to, for pupils. Um, and it's just about thinking differently with regard to marketing. So I was working uh, with a grammar school in the heart of Kent, which is grammar school country, as uh, some of you will know. And there, there was a lot of competition in Kent. There's a lot of grammar schools in Kent. Um, so the, the grammar school that I was working with was finding it difficult to, to get their pupil numbers. So they actually took their, their marketing, shall we say, over to Dartford. Uh, they were based in the Medway Towns and Dartford is probably, I don't know, 15, 20 miles away from where they're based. Um, and actually started marketing there um, because there aren't so many grammar schools in that particular area. And then sort of, you know, saying to parents, you know, it's really quite easy to get here on the train. We'll provide a bus to, to, to collect children from the railway station to take them to the school. And they were actually able to improve their pupil numbers by going a bit more out of their local geographic area. And I thought that's quite an interesting marketing ploy and one that I hadn't thought of, because obviously, you know, there's a demand for grammar school places, particularly if you're in Kent. Other things that, that I've picked up from trusts that I've been to is the use of a cost reduction consultant, whereby this only really works in secondaries where you've got a large spend on resources, but there are consultants out there who will come in and analyse um, your spend on all non-staffing and see whether they can get you a better deal. You basically have to sign up with them, I think it is for two years, to say that you'll use their suppliers. They get some of the profits, you get the rest of the profits. It's worth looking into, and that was something that, that I did with one of my schools as well. Um, I think also smarter use of resources, always looking for good ideas on that. I'm sure that a lot of you will have had paper cut installed on your multifunctional devices. Uh, but one school that I was working with uh, said, um, so we give all our departments, they've got a spend limit per week on their photocopying. And, um, you know, once they've used that up, then they basically have to come and ask us for permission to use any more copying. And you might think that that's a bit draconian, but actually, if, you've, if you're in a large secondary school and you're spending a lot of money on photocopying, it's a good way of, you know, getting, you know, teachers and other staff who are using the copies to think about how much does this cost to actually use. So various different things there um, about, you know, lessons that I've learned. And there have been some really innovative things. Excuse me. <coughs> so one of the multi-academy trusts that I worked with um, were actually sponsored by a university and the university um, did courses in, in counselling, professional counselling. And so they basically had counselling ambassadors that would go from the university as part of their course to work with, you know, students at, at the school um, that um, the, the trust was the sponsor for. And I thought, well, that's a really innovative, you know, use of uh, cross fertilisation, shall we say. It was good experience for the students who were on the counselling course. And obviously it was free counselling for the, for the students in the school. So different ideas like that come up, you know, when you're an SRMA and, and they can be really quite innovative and insightful. So it, it's always a good, a good experience to learn from the skills that you're working with. I wonder, Joe, just based on a, uh, one of the earlier points you made there, have you ever made a negative savings recommendation? Hasn't recommended the school spends more in a certain area? 
Do you know, I don't think I have, actually. Have you? I, I have seen a lot of them in reports, though. It tends to be most often in uh, IT and capital, where an SRMA will say, you're not spending enough here and you're storing yourself up problems for the future. So, yeah, I'm going to recommend that you say negative this. Yeah. So it's, it's not all about cost savings. It's about uh, kind of releasing money for priorities, but also perhaps identifying areas where, uh, where money isn't kind of um, being spent. I mean, one I've done recently... I didn't actually recommend a negative saving, but I was keen to highlight to a school, they'd recently moved into a new building. Um, so they were spending £5,000 a year on building maintenance. Now that works for the first year in a new building, but it, it doesn't work for very much longer. So highlighting things like that, where actually school is going to have to start spending a very different way, um, perhaps that hadn't quite landed in terms of their financial forecasting and, and understanding of their priorities. Lovely. Uh, we've got about five minutes um, where I was wondering if anybody would like to ask a question. Yeah, got one here. Go and the video. Um, it was based on something that uh, that you said, Joe. You were giving some interesting examples of um, uh, of looking at uh, return on certain activities, maybe non non core activities, swimming pools and and after school clubs and and so on. Um, I'm a, a chair of trustees. And if I think of some of the, the head teachers and, and CEOs and people that I know um, and imagine what they might say in response to that, that sort of suggestion, it would be, yeah, but you can't measure the value of, of this after school club in financial terms. Yeah, but the, you know, the, the, we have disadvantaged families and they really need it or working families and they need it. And you can't measure it financially. I'm, I'm imagining that that's the sort of thing that they might say. Um, What's your, what's your, well, for both of you, what's your view on, on, on that sort of uh, area of, of cost saving where maybe the value to the school or the trust it isn't easy to measure financially? Uh, where, you know, where do you, how do you see that? So basically, don't, don't misunderstand me. Uh, I wasn't necessarily saying that they needed to be cost saving in that particular area. I'm talking about knowing what your income and expenditure is in that area. Um, if you know, it, you know, I, I totally get where, where you're coming from in terms of you know, it's not all about measuring the value of something financially, but it's know what your income and expenditure is. And if you make a decision that that is an, a, an area that we're going to support financially, we're not expecting it to break even. Then obviously that has a knock on a cost, a knock on a, sorry, an opportunity cost of where you might have spent that money elsewhere. But if that's a decision that the trust wants to make in terms of we're going to support this because we see and understand the value of it then that's absolutely fine in my view. Just know what the income and expenditure is and know that it fits in with your vision, mission and values to be supporting that activity. I totally agree with that. I mean, I think the, the context is also very important. So a school in deficits is obviously in a different position to a school that's, that's got a balanced budget. So if you're a school in deficits, you're going to have to find some ways of either generating extra income or making some savings. Whereas a school that's, uh, that has a, a balanced budget, the situation is different. So that, that does have an influence. Um, one of the things we look at in the deployments is the school development plan. Um, and one thing we, we often recommend is the schools uh, put some additional costing into the school development plan. So it's really helpful for schools to have actually quite an aspirational plan. Often the school development plan, in my experience, isn't very aspirational. It's just the things schools are already doing. And I would say, well, actually, put in the things you want to do, put some costs against them, because then you can start to weigh all these things up and say, well, actually, we, we want to do this and this. We're already doing this and this, and this is what it costs us. We could do those if we didn't do those, which would add the most value within our context. And that's a decision that the school has to make. It's not a decision that, that we can make, but what we can do is provide some of the information or, or enable the school to understand the process by which they might make those sorts of judgments. We've got time for one more question. I just ask, do you actually, I'll give you like the scenario of my school, we've got about 85 support staff. And I, I, We've got about 85 support staff, and I think we're overstaffed. And as part of your, um, there's, there's a lot of need in our school, and that's because of the high deprivation, we have a lot of staff, support staff, pastoral, as well as we have quite a lot of admin staff because we have a very uh, dispersed school, and you need key admin staff in certain areas. And do you actually go around and look at the roles that people do within the school? Because it's all well and good looking at a list of staff and what their job title is and maybe seeing what their job description, but actually seeing what they do and how much of their time 
they they contribute to the school community because one of my problems is that I ask someone to do something and they say, oh, I'm far too busy. And I'm thinking, oh, oh. And I haven't got time to go around all these, these staff. And a lot of these staff are managed by teachers who unfortunately don't know how to manage support staff. Um, I'm sorry, no discredit to any teachers here in the room, but um, uh, or other senior leaders maybe who uh, do not hold these staff to account. Sorry, it's a very long-winded question. One, one minute. So, okay. so, sorry. So typically we would start a deployment with a scoping meeting. So in that scoping meeting, you would try and work out what the key areas to look into are likely to be. So, so in your context, if, if you were saying that's an area you're concerned about, that would probably, yes, would prompt us to go and look into that in more detail and understand the context of the school. We'd probably also do some ICFP analysis. So that, that might or might not show that up to be an issue. The statistics you can look at, so you can look at, well, if a school says it's high need, actually, if you look at the percentage in S of pupils with SEN or the deprivation level, is it high need? Um, but you do also sometimes have to actually get under the bonnet and look at the detail of that. You know, statistics tell you something, but they don't give you the full answer. And sometimes it does involve going around a school and talking to people and find out what they do. Joe, I don't know if you want to add yeah. to that. I'm not sure I've got anything to add to that, actually, Patrick. I think you've summed it up quite nicely. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much.